I'm Mike Sharkey. I'll be emceeing the conference for a few of the sessions over the next few days. Um, but I wanted to get started with um, our esteemed CIO, Lev Gonick, uh, who is going to have some introductory words and then introduce our keynote speaker. So, Lev, take it away, please. Thanks, Mike, and thank you, chefs. I'm uh, hoping you're all ready to uh, get to work um, here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to uh, share with uh, all of you a couple of my own recipes uh, for success. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that for those of you who've been with uh, us through the data conference, you'll take a moment to reflect that this is our fifth uh, annual uh, data conference here at ASU. Um, Obviously, uh, these last couple of years have been exceptional. Um, I do remember in year one, we had about 300 uh, people registered for the event. Uh, today, we have uh, over 750 uh, people registered uh, for this multi-day gathering. And uh, along with you, I'm, I'm very, very uh, pleased to see the level of participation. I also want to acknowledge uh, a, a terrific, I would sort of call it a maturation uh, uh, of the engagement. Uh, certainly in the earlier years, I very much sort of saw uh, us very much in kind of a nascent form in terms of building a community of practice across ASU when it comes to data. And um, I think we've definitely been focusing over these last several years um, in terms of enabling uh, the creation of the community, getting the tools together to actually uh, support the community of practice around uh, data in support of decision making across the institution and the enterprise, uh, up, upskilling, uh, supporting that activity. Uh, we're certainly seeing in this last year, uh, thanks to all of you, some significant payoff in, in terms of that uh, shift from sort of that early enabling and nascent state towards what I know is a much more sophisticated uh, and I would say mature a community of practice in the making. I do want to, uh, in the spirit of the um, sort of the theme of the of the event, uh, very much try to uh, focus in on um, the importance of uh, sort of some key ingredients, uh, at least in my own mind, um, as it relates to uh, the topic at hand. And uh, some of you know I. I I kind of like to do a sideline as a, as a chef. Uh, and so this comes with a lot of experience uh, uh, that I offer you. It's Lev's five steps to successful uh, culinary uh, experiences. Uh, and I dare say after uh, more than 40 years in the kitchen, uh, I speak with some authority uh, to these issues here. So um, here's step number one. It's all about the ingredients. Very, very important to understand that uh, good quality ingredients uh, are the absolute key to any, any uh, recipe and any success in the kitchen. Uh, and certainly in the context of what we're working on uh, together here, uh, it's all about the quality of the data. Um, and it turns out that that's actually e much easier said than done. Uh, there is a huge amount of work that has to happen uh, to establish uh, standards for what is good quality data, uh, for actually curating that data, um, and for establishing governance on that data. So certainly the quality of the ingredients is critical to any success in the kitchen. The second sort of most important thing that any chef will tell you is that you have to have a great collection of knives and pots and pans uh, to work with. Uh, and it's worth spending the extra time and the extra money uh, on those key uh, utensils. Uh, and that's what we've been doing, I think, here at ASU. Um, and that is, we've been very much focused on making sure we have the right tools, good tools, the best tools uh, for the broad range of needs that we have when it comes to analytics uh, at ASU. Uh, and knowing that one size doesn't fit all, making sure that we have a set of knives, a set of pots, a set of pans uh, that meets the broad uh, and diverse needs of, of the community uh, around us. And then what every chef knows and too few customers ever really appreciate, 
is that it's all about the preparation and the organization in the kitchen. 70% of the time, easily, if not more, it's all about prep. And it's all of the proverbial sausage making that goes on that nobody really sees. And that's okay. And we do the same thing when it comes to data analytics and data sharing. It's a ton of scrubbing and wrangling and ETL development. That's just absolutely uh, the bread and butter, if you will, uh, of what we do in the analytics space. Hugely important to, uh, especially in this community, to appreciate uh, the level of detail that needs to be spent uh, on preparation in the kitchen, uh, preparation in, in the data analytics uh, space to, to organizing uh, 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 the work that then needs to go forward. And if you get your ingredients and you have the right utensils um, and you've managed to organize, uh, you're, you're almost there, you're almost there. Uh, it's then all about execution. It's all about execution uh, in the actual um, delivery and development of the, you know, on your ovens and stoves uh, along the way. And it's about bringing all of the IT, IT tools that we have in this context uh, to literally hit the executables um, and to uh, begin the iterative process of execution uh, and then assessing whether or not uh, um, the cakes are ready to come out of the oven, the steaks are ready to come off the grill, testing and uh, making sure that it's actually being prepared to exactly what the customer uh, is interested in. Um, and the last step in Lev's five key steps to running a great kitchen is actually about making sure that when the plates go out, they are actually looking like the presentation is what the customer sees. And it's hugely important to understand that for the customer, all of the other elements are essentially invisible to them. Uh, and so report, report writing and presentations and visualizations of the data are actually what most of our customers actually see. Hugely important for us to uh, understand uh, the needs of the customer, also to understand what the customer can actually uh, uh, consume and how they like to actually see uh, the analytical data that is uh, being presented to them. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, five key uh, steps to uh, the uh, preparation of a great meal and for great data, it seems to me, uh, working on great ingredients, having the right utensils, prepping and organizing and appreciating how much time goes into uh, prepping uh, and organizing. The actual execution, which for a good chef is actually does not take much time at all. Um, and then, of course, the presentation uh, at the end. Now, the question that we have here is what kind of a, you know, restaurant environment are we uh, committed to? And here at ASU, uh, we actually have a uh, very much sort of from our charter, uh, a commitment to uh, fundamentally focusing in on student success and making sure that our analytical efforts are focused in on that specific uh, outcome. And more broadly, what I would call making sure that our analytics and our data um, are used for good. And our keynote uh, to kick us off this year uh, is a uh, veteran of what it means to be thinking about organizing capacity for data for good. Uh, equity in data is what Heather Krause has spent most of her career uh, working on. Uh, she uh, has more than 20 years of experience in this space, uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally, working on human-centered design for the use of data to solve real uh, applied challenges facing uh, us at multiple scales uh, of social need uh, that, that are out there. Also hugely important, our consideration, especially in this day and age around the ethical use of data and how best to think about how we build trust in the use of data, especially when it comes to the ways in which uh, we gather data about students in the aspiration of helping them succeed uh, along the way. A huge set of considerations 
as well. And the thing that, and the most important thing, at least from my vantage point, having watched much of Heather Krause's career, is her commitment, as is our commitment, to building community, a community of practitioners uh, together, uh, com com uh, committed to and focused in advancing uh, the broader good. Uh, in our case, not only the good for our students, but for the role of a great university in its community uh, around us, uh, advancing the priorities of both the university and, and the community around that. And with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to introduce our keynote, Heather Krause. Thanks, Lev. Hey, Lev, this is Mike. We're having some technical issues on our side with getting Heather in the room. So we're, we're, while we're working on that, I'm going to do the overview of the agenda. So um, thank you so much for that intro. Um, having been fortunate enough to have had a meal at Lev's house, I can tell you that uh, he knows what he's talking about on the food side. And the five points in his analogy to data are incredibly spot on. So thank you so much for that, Lev. Um, I am going to jump in and give a intro of what you guys are all in store for for the next few days. Um, so I am going to share my screen here. And uh, as Heather's coming on, I'm going to jump into what we're going through on this wonderful event for the next uh, three days. So. Um, I'll go over a few things and go over the agenda so people know where to go. Um, as we've done in previous years, we have our persona, our citizens, apprentice, knights, and wizards, and all of the sessions in the data conference um, have these labels there so you know where you may fit or what a sessions might be appropriate. Um, we also have badges you can earn. Um, by going through the sessions. And so um, here are different badges that one can earn um, for completing different kinds of sessions. You can see the data wrangling, data finding. Um, we've got entrees and appetizers. Um, and so completing combinations of those different sessions today will earn you badges. Um, if you go to the website, which I'll have in a minute, um, or you can find it, um, the ASU Data Conference website, um, there is a section that says claim your badge. So um, after the conference, um, if you've met some of these, feel free to, um, thanks Brianna for putting the link in the chat, um, go to the website and claim your badge and you'll get these badges for accomplishing those different tasks. So love that we get some recognition for the things that we're accomplishing here. Um, we have the Slack channel, the ASU data community, which is persistent and uh, is a great place to share experiences and what's going on and sessions you've been to and places to connect and share. So please use Slack um, as we most of us already do to increase the level of community here. Um, I know in previous years we've had a lot of really good conversation going on. Um, I love it sort of as a back channel or side channel of people that are in a certain session and talking about the presenter and, and the amazing things those presenters are sharing. Um, so please use Slack in the ASU-data-community channel throughout the next few days. Um, here's a great slide of an overview of the agenda. Um, Again, you can see in the Zoom chat, there is a link to the data conference website, um, but you can see the at a glance here. Um, so we are here in the uh, keynote section, um, and then we've got some appetizers and entrees today. Um, we've got a welcome tomorrow uh, with entrees, appetizers, and a large cooking classes, um, both tomorrow, Tuesday the 16th, and Wednesday the 17th. And then um, I'm really excited that we are getting back together in person. Um, having gone virtual last year, um, we felt that we were in a good position to do a hybrid model this year. So in addition to the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday from 9 to 11-ish in the morning, um, we're going to have Wednesday afternoon at the MU on Tempe campus. 
And we are going to have an in-person networking event. Um, it's a great opportunity for folks to get together, to meet um, colleagues, and we're going to have a little fun too. Um, many of you know Chopped on the Food Network as a cooking competition show. Well, we've got Sliced, uh, and Sliced is our data competition show. So we have four teams of uh, two data analysts on each team. Um, they have a data set, and they're going to be asked a uh, introspective question about the data, and they're going to have a half hour to pull together a presentation and then to share with everyone in the audience. And we're going to crown our first annual Sliced Data Conference champion. So that'll be a real fun way to add to what's going on um, uh, in the networking event. So please come. We've got food. Obviously, there's no way we're going to get away without having food on a food themed event. Um, and then as far as today, we've got our appetizer sessions in the morning at, right after the keynote from 10 to 10.20. And you can see some of the presenters and what they'll be presenting about. And again, if you go to the Zoom chat, um, you have the data conference website where all of this exists and the Zoom links to all the sessions. So everything is right there on the data conference website. Uh, and then session two this afternoon from 10.30 to 11.10. We've got another set of uh, six presentations. Um, and again, like I said, we are not going to be short on food related puns for the next few days. So seeing uh, the scoop on analytics portal and actual analytics gumbo and unwrapped and cooking, we've got plenty of it. So really happy that everyone's part of this. Um, so like we said, go to the data conference website. It's there on the screen. It's in the Zoom chat. Um, and then um, once you get there, you can click to join and jump right to the sessions. So before we finish up here, um, I wanted to do some thank yous. Um, first of all, the presenters. The presenters are the one who make this conference what it is. Um, and so they are. Um, have done a phenomenal job of voluntarily saying, hey, here's some information I want to share. Um, and you will see many of these folks throughout the session today. So thank you, presenters, for what you do. And then, of course, the volunteers. Um, these are the people who are helping out with the organization, helping out with the um, Zoom sessions, with the recordings, uh, general logistics. Um, the folks in bold are the ones who've done all the planning behind the scenes. Uh, logistics and food and gifts and physical setup and everything else. So um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everyone for being part of this. Um, for what was started, uh, Kristen and team started this five years ago, and to see the level it's grown to is absolutely incredible. So thanks all for being part of this. Great. So that's what we've got here. I'm going to check in with my colleagues and see if we're ready for keynote. We are not. Uh, apparently, okay. there's been an update in the settings and we are not able to get Heather in and we're trying to get her to call in and that hasn't happened yet. Okay. We don't have her phone number or we would call her to ask what's going on, but we can't, there's no phone numbers anywhere, apparently. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do is give it a few more minutes. Um, thanks for that update, Erin, appreciate it. Um, the old setting of not in the ASU domain is making it hard for an outside person to get in. Um, so sorry for the delay there. Um, what I want to do is uh, explain about what's going on on Wednesday, because I want to get as many people out here as we can um, for this session on Wednesday. So um, here's the at a glance. And you can see at uh, from 2.30 to 5, we're going to be in the MU. Um, and uh, I'm fortunate that we're things are in a good enough place that we could be back in person today. Um, and, uh, and so I want to take advantage of that. The, as you know, for people that are in the data community here at ASU, 
some of the things we do in Slack with our community um, are where's the data channel, our data community channel, Alteryx Tableau uh, is such a helpful resource for folks. And I want to build off of that because I know firsthand um, how many people here contribute to the community, rely on the community, um, and to get people who are comfortable coming in face to face to meet those people and share with them, I think is a wonderful event. So um, the Sliced Game Show um, is a really fun backdrop to it. Um, the people who volunteered are wonderful data analysts um, throughout the ASU community uh, who have uh, said, hey, I will put myself on stage and do this challenge. Um, they've been given a data set. Um, so they've been give, given a data set uh, that we created with about 80,000 rows of data. Um, and they've been looking through and examining what's going on. And then on Wednesday, um, we're gonna be asking them a couple of questions about, or one question about the data. And they're gonna have to use their data analyst skills to tell a story and to answer that question with a data story. Um, and so they are going to be um, on there. They're going to be uh, creating visualizations. Uh, if you've seen uh, Chopped or Iron Chef, uh, we're going to have the judges. Uh, uh, myself and Haley and Jinjing, uh, colleagues of mine from UTO, uh, and we're going to jump in and share. So looking forward to that. Erin, how are we looking? She's in. She's on the phone. We have Heather on the phone. We got her in though. So she's here. Wonderful. All right. So with that, thank you very much for helping out. Heather, um, you've been introduced very kindly by our CIO, Lev Gonick, and I'm going to pass it on to you, Heather. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> for dealing with the, the technical gremlins. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, um, is just to make sure that I understand, is somebody sharing my slides? So I, we can do, I don't have a link to it. We can absolutely do that, Heather, but I don't have a link right uh, now. Okay. Um, that Not received fine, your slides, yet. We haven't gotten them yet. Okay, that's funny. Maybe they're also having some technical gremlins because we sent them a uh, five or 10 minutes ago. That's fine. Um, I will just talk because I can talk about data equity for a long time. <laughs> and um, I think we'll start um, with an introduction that um, people like yourselves, people who uh, need to use data to understand what's going on with, with people and with um, systems that are supposed to support people face a very serious equity issue when we're working with data. And the issue is that we are always making accidentally prejudiced choices that we're not aware of. And mostly the reason that we are making accidentally prejudiced choices um, is because we have been taught to believe that quantitative data is like a silver bullet against bias and prejudice and um, stereotypes. I mean, the reason that most of us actually want to use data is because we wanna make decisions that are reliable and that are fair and that, they're, that are just and that are unbiased. And so we've been taught that quantitative data is kind of the path because quantitative data is the objective kind of data. And um, I have bad news and good news about that. The bad news is that quantitative data is not objective data. Um, quantitative data is not value neutral at all uh, and always represents somebody's worldview, somebody's priorities, and somebody's lived experiences. But more importantly than that being bad news, uh, that is actually fantastic news. And the reason that that's fantastic news is that it means that we can use 
the quantitative data that we have to actually center the lived experiences that we are trying to highlight or that we're trying to understand. So um, the fact that quantitative data is in fact not value neutral, not a view from nowhere, is kind of bad news if, if um, you think that it's a silver bullet, um, but it's great news if you're trying to use data to center and improve equity in your work. Um, I'm just gonna share a little example uh, for that, that I think is related to the work that you folks are trying to do. And let's say that we are trying to, um, a real, let's, actually I'm gonna take a real project that we're working on with a government. And that government is in the state and they are doing some work, some anti-poverty initiatives. And they have a lot of data that they'd like us to use to help them understand whether their project was a success. And we can use their data to show that before they started their project, the average monthly income in their community was $800. And after the project, the average monthly income was $1,300. So it, it seems good. Um, but there are a number of different zip codes within that community. And we can use that same data to kind of disaggregate information and say, um, what, what was the experience before and after this project in different zip codes? And let's say um, in zip code number one, the income doubled. The income went from $900 a month to $1,800 a month. While in zip code two, the income didn't change. Before the project, the in average income was 700 after the average income was 700. So the, the project didn't work for all kinds of people. That can help us figure out how we're gonna use data to answer the question, is our project a success? If we're doing a new initiative, it's supposed to help people, is it a success? This is the same data set and we can analyze it one way to say, well, um, if our definition of success is that we would um, have the average overall income change. Yeah, our project was a huge success. Um, but if we wanted um, the distribution of that change to be relatively equal, then no, our project wasn't really a success because some zip codes, people increased their income a lot and some zip codes, people didn't change their incomes at all. And then the third way that we might want to define success is what did this do for income inequality? And of course, because different zip codes change at different rates, uh, we would find that this project, and what really happened in real life with this project is that um, it quadrupled income inequality. So the income gap between the lowest and highest earners in the community um, increased by more than four times. So this is a, like a just quick illustration of how one of the ways that we make choices to prioritize a certain lived experience or a certain set of values over the other. Who gets to define success is really important. You can take one data set and prove that this project is a huge success, a moderate success, or a huge failure. With the same data set, <laughs> depending on who gets to get their worldview or their value system um, embedded in that definition of success. And this is the essence of equity in data science is what choices are we making and who gets to make those choices? Um, we kind of like to think in the old fashioned way that um, you know, data is objective and it's objective and we, the subjective part is maybe deciding what question we want to ask. And then we answer that question using objective data, objective analysis. We get some objective results and we make an evidence-based decision that is neutral or unbiased. Um, but most of you, if not all of you here, either work with data or make decisions based on data. And if you just reflect for a minute over the process that you use to create and communicate a data project, you'll see that there's dozens and dozens and dozens of choices. Um, we need to choose project design. We need to choose what numerators and denominators we want to use. Um, we need to want. We need to choose metrics. We need to choose uh, social identity. 
and how we're going to collect data and analyze social identity. So each one of those choices is where the power of embedding equity in your data lies. Um, every time somebody makes one of these choices, they're embedding a specific worldview or prioritizing a lived experience. And so these choices are where the power lies. And you can't avoid making these choices. Sometimes people say, you know, well, we really need an unbiased, um, entirely neutral piece of research. Uh, and that isn't possible. It's not possible to avoid making these choices. So the best we can do is kind of make these choices with attention to the lived experiences that we're trying to center. And remembering the whole time that equity in data is not a destination, it's a process. It's not a binary state. There's no such thing as a, like a certified equitable piece of research. <laughs> um, and that every choice reflects and embeds a worldview or a lived experience. And this, rather than being bad news, especially for people in your sector, this is great news um, because we really want to center um, experiences of students, experiences of certain types of students, um, experiences of different communities, experiences of different parts of the ASU community. And the way to do that is by paying attention to every choice that you're making around a data project from um, what resources are going to be used to um, how you're going to design the project to who is included in making realistic important decisions around the project um, and down to how is data collected and analyzed um, the choices that the statisticians make in terms of how to analyze data are uh, incredibly influential in terms of what the results are. And most statistical methods um, are not determined by like the data or the math. Most statistical methods are, are chosen because they reflect a specific worldview. And so every aspect from funding to design to data collection to analysis to communication contain dozens of choices that allow us to align our data project with a worldview that we want to center. And as a research community, as a science community, uh, as, a, as an evidence-based community at ASU, uh, one of the things that's important for each of us to do at this particular juncture is to spend some time thinking about which parts of our, our scientific processes or our um, knowledge management processes or our business intelligence processes, which, which elements of those processes are important for um, accurate, rigorous, repeatable, usable knowledge generation? And which of those elements are actually just habits or conventions that have been passed down uh, over time and may not serve uh, our equity goals anymore. Uh, for example, one of the habits that has been passed down in many, many disciplines and sectors is what we do with small sample sizes of um, various social identity groups or um, other small communities. And um, one, one of the habits that we have is to, let's say we're doing a, a a student satisfaction survey. And let's say that we have a lot of responses from students who self-identify as white, a medium amount of um, answers from students who self-identify as black, and a small amount from students who self-identify as American Indian or, um, or Native American. One of the things that's often a habit is to report out the results from a satisfaction survey like that. And, and instead of um, say, saying something like 80% um, of our white students feel satisfied, 70% uh, of our black students feel satisfied and our American Indian students um, responses are not statistically significant. And this is a problem. This is a great example of a, an equity problem that is incorrect both mathematically and problematic humanly. 
<laughs> and what that means is that um, when we say that these results are not statistically significant, um, we're making a mathematical error. It's a habit that is not scientifically correct uh, in that there is no test for the statistical significance of a sample size. There are lots of places where we would want to use a test for statistical significance, but a sample size is not one of them. And, in, or the other thing is like putting an asterisk or putting um, not reliable. All of these things aren't really mathematically correct. And we've heard a lot of feedback from small communities, particularly the American Indian and Native um, American community that um, suppressing results from small sample sizes uh, is a further, is, inter is interpreted and felt as a further doubling down on um, discounting or, or making experiences invisible. What we need to say, instead of these results are not statistically significant or, the, or, the, or not meaningful or suppressed for reliability, we need to say our results contain uncertainty. And we need to find a way to talk about and express that uncertainty in a way that our audience can understand. There's lots of very, very non-technical ways to talk about like the range, like instead of saying 80% of our white respondents are satisfied, we can say something like, um, you know, 75 to 85% of the white identifying students are satisfied and then um, 60 to 70% of the black identifying students are satisfied and then uh, 40 to 70% of the American Indian identifying students are satisfied. That, that, and a non-technical person can understand that. And then we need to take the next step and say, why our results contain that uncertainty? Our results contain that uncertainty um, because, um, because of the way that the data was collected, the way that our project was designed. So this is important because it takes the responsibility or, or the risk or the vulnerability um, off of that small population and puts it onto where it should be, which is the research community. So that's just an example of the ways that we can make choices and examine our habits and our conventions to see, you know, is this really necessary? What are the mathematical elements of this habit or this process or this choice? And what are the human elements? So one of the things I really like to stress when I'm talking about data equity is that if, if anyone tries to, um, say to you, oh, we don't actually, um, we, we need to have rigorous good science. We don't have the space to do equitable science. Um, that's a false dichotomy. There is no difference between uh, good science and equitable science. There's no difference between accurate, robust, reliable science and equitable science. It's the same thing. And, um, if you want to have quantitative evidence that you can um, invest dollars in, that you can make decisions about, that you can um, guide, guide humans and students uh, with, it's essential that that evidence be accurate, that it be rigorous, that it be reliable, and that it be equitable. And the way that we do that, there's six basic steps that you can take away with you today to help you do that. The first step is to recognize that we are all making subjective human choices in our data work. That's the most important thing is to kind of break down this myth of, you know, numbers don't lie. And that is to a certain extent true if we're very, very careful with the way that we use numbers. Uh, it can be true that they don't lie, but the more important question is whose truth do they tell? And the way you can answer that question, whose truth do they tell, is by starting A, number one, recognizing that we're making subjective human choices. And then two, identify as many of those choices in your data processes as possible. Number three, make the choices in your data projects that reflect the equity that you want to see. So first realize that choices are being made. Second, identify the specific choices that were within your scope 
And that's true if you're doing um, student outcome analysis, if you're doing um, business analytics, if you're doing human resources, there are no data projects that don't involve critical human choices that embed a worldview and center a lived experience. And then four, expands the group of people who get to make meaningful choices about the data processes. Five is talk about, be transparent about your data choices. Anytime you're putting out a report or building a dashboard um, or making decisions, it's really important that the critical choices that prioritize one lived experience or worldview over another are made plain so that other people are able to understand whose experiences are being amplified and decide how they wanna use whatever data products you are providing them. And then of course, number six is be ready to go back to the beginning and make even better choices the next time. So those are the six basic steps that you can take away right now into, into the rest of the uh, exciting uh, data talks and activities that you have planned. Um, and just remember that this isn't, this isn't bad news. It's not bad news that quantitative data is, is not objective, is, is not um, unbiased. It's actually good news that our data and our data projects reflect how we see the world because it means we can choose equity. And um, thank you for having me. <laughs>